As we continue in worship and hear another word of God's scripture, let us prepare our hearts with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, draw near to us once more. As we walk with you in this Easter season, lift our hearts, encourage us during the days that we may abide with you in the evenings and trust that you are with us always. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as a companion to the reading of the resurrection stories from Luke 24, this is a short psalm. It's psalm number four. Answer me when I call, O God of my right, for you gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for God's self. The Lord hears whenever I call to God. So when you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices. Put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O oh Lord. But you have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and their wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me to lie down in safety. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine that it's the end of the day. The sun has gone down. The day's work is over. The doors are locked. The house lights are turned off. You are in bed and under the covers. There's no more TV, no more phones, no more books or magazines. You yawn and you let your head hit the pillow. But for some reason, you can't get to sleep. Is the room too hot or too cold? Are the kids still rustling around in their rooms, or does the dog need to be let out again? Your body is tired, but your mind feels wide awake. You lie there still, but your monkey brain is racing a mile a minute. So what can you do when you need a good night's sleep? Now, I know this is a risky topic, a minister preaching a sermon about sleep. I've seen a few of you nodding off in the pews. And with this live stream service, this is even riskier since half of you are watching the worship right now, probably still wearing your pajamas. I generally sleep pretty well at night, usually seven and a half hours. But there are times when I can't sleep or when I doze off for a while, but then I find myself awake at two or three in the morning with my mind racing and sleep nowhere to be found. I keep a notepad next to my bed to jot down things that wake me up in the night so that I can deal with them and remember them in the morning. But if it's bigger things, well then I'll go downstairs, I'll drink some milk or read for a little bit, and then eventually I return to bed, hoping that sleep will grace me with its healing mercies once more. Why do we sleep anyway? Scientists actually aren't entirely sure. Some have suggested that sleep is an evolutionary way we develop to conserve energy, energy that we will need when the sun comes up and we have to forage for food or work for a living. Most scientists believe that sleep helps restore our bodies. It's a time when our tissues and muscles can repair, when we can synthesize more proteins or release the hormones that keep us healthy when we're awake. Other brain and sleep experts insist that sleep helps our brain literally process all the events of the day prior. Little babies will sleep anywhere from 13 to 14 hours a day, and most of that time is spent in, in REM sleep, R-E-M sleep. And that involves both dreaming and active brain 
uh, engagement. And there's been plenty of studies that have shown that sleep deprivation impairs our ability to learn and to function efficiently. So that's why Shakespeare called sleep nature's gentle nurse. There is something amazing about sleep. The comedian George Carlin once remarked, people say, I'm going to sleep now as if it were nothing, but it, it really is a bizarre activity. He said, for the next several hours, I'm going to be unconscious, temporarily losing control over everything I know and understand, but when the sun returns, I will simply resume my life. And he's right. Sleep is this unusual type of surrender, a laying down of arms. Whatever work you're up to your eyeballs in, whatever joys and sorrows you're feeling, all of that is set aside as you choose to drift off into oblivion. For a while, you give up being in charge. You put yourself in the hands of the night, or more specifically, into the hands of the one who created day and night. That last comment is quite important. A few years ago, a study in Psychology Today suggested that religious people actually sleep better. And with those who regularly attended church services, they were the ones more likely to report the best sleep quality. And again, I'm pretty sure they meant at night as opposed to sleeping during the services themselves. Now, part of this was linked to their belief in God, a God who is active in their lives. One researcher commented, if you believe a higher power is out there looking out for you, then what you're going through and worrying about must be temporary. Our faith then reduces stress by giving us a sense of hope and reducing sadness and thereby letting us sleep better. It's like the old saying of Victor Hugo's, go to sleep in peace, for God is awake. Now I want you to think about all of these things while we revisit some of the Bible stories associated with Jesus' resurrection appearances on Easter. All of the resurrection appearances of Christ happened during the waking hours of the day. The women went to the tomb early in the morning on Easter, and there they encountered the risen Christ. Later, the disciples gathered there in the upper room when suddenly Christ appeared in their midst. Two disciples were walking on the road back to their home in Emmaus when Jesus joined them. Simon Peter was out fishing on the Sea of Galilee when Christ called to him from the shoreline and invited him and the others to join him for a special meal. Now, actually, this may not seem like a surprising fact. The risen Christ might have simply chosen to appear to the disciples during the daylight hours. But remember, all of the Gospels were written years after Jesus' death and resurrection. The earliest Gospels were written 30 or 40 years after Easter, and John's Gospel was written 50, maybe 60 years after the fact. So perhaps there's something else involved in the choice of daytime resurrection stories and it might have more meaning than we first assumed. So I want you to put yourself in the place of those very first disciples and ask a basic question. How well would I have slept on those first nights after Christ's Easter resurrection? I don't think I personally would have slept very well. My mind would have been racing. I mean, Jesus had risen from the dead. He'd appeared in the flesh. He'd torn down and ripped apart the curtain that usually separated the living from the dead. And so I would be lying there wondering, what does this really mean? So I can imagine that the Gospels were written as answers to the Easter questions that were keeping the early church disciples awake at night. Think about the order of events in the passage that Heather and I just read from Luke chapter 24. 
So you're lying awake in bed, anxious, unsure what the Easter stories mean. And so as you're lying there, remember that the first thing Luke records Jesus saying is Christ's calming voice, peace, peace be with you. As you lay there, your monkey brain is sure that the only way Jesus could have appeared in that upper room before the disciples is because he was actually a ghost. But the second thing that Luke has Jesus tell the group is, look at me, touch me. Does a ghost have flesh and bones as I have? So then maybe you begin to wonder, well, perhaps Christ has been transformed. He's totally different. And in fact, in this new form, he no longer can relate to us. He no longer particularly is connected to the mundane flesh and blood realities of our worlds. As if to put that doubt to rest, in Luke's gospel, Christ asks for something to eat. He asks for a piece of fish, and then he eats it like any old guest at the dinner table. So in effect, after saying to the group, peace, I'm not a ghost. I'm still just like you. I still care and love you. Then Jesus cut to the chase. And he tells those first disciples, and he tells us the important things that we need to hold on to and that all the secondary things that are disturbing our sleep, we can simply put to the side. Jesus says, remember, the scriptures, the prophecies, all of them were finally fulfilled in the events of my life, my death, and my resurrection. The Messiah, the Christ, the beloved of God, had to suffer and die in order to overcome death, to rise up, and let a new truth finally be announced to the world. In this act, in this gracious, loving sacrifice, forgiveness is made real for all. A new beginning has dawned. God's love, Christ's redeeming grace, and the Spirit's enlivening power now are totally active in this Easter world. And at that point, Jesus gives us something to really think about. He says, you are witnesses of these things. We are the ones who now live out and tell this story. Nothing else matters in light of that good news. See, the gospel writers don't try to tell us everything about the risen Christ. They only answer the persistent questions that were keeping us awake at night. And the Gospels refocus our minds on what is most important. Christ is alive and with us. And we, we're the witnesses. We're the embodiment. We're the tellers of that good news. And when it boils down to that, we can finally get a good night's sleep. And that's why I love pairing the Luke resurrection stories with the the little Psalm 4. Because Psalm 4 begins with this voice from the ages crying out in the night, praying, O God, answer me in my need. Be gracious to me. Hear my prayer. And then the response comes back telling us not to be troubled in those late hours. The psalm says, when you are disturbed, do not sin, ponder it in your beds, and be silent. And then the psalm ends with those words of confident faith. When we, with the church of the ages, can say in full trust, O Lord, Lord, I will lie down and I will sleep in peace. For you alone, you make me to lie down in safety. We proclaim the gospel story about Christ's resurrection during the daytime so that the world may sleep peacefully at night. Now, yes, I know, there's still, there's still much that troubles us. These remain uncertain and difficult times. There are diseases and tragic accidents. There are violent shootings and international tension. There are broken relationships between people and races. There are money woes, 
There are job woes. There are hospital concerns. There are stresses that dog our every waking hour. But those things have never been the full story. Every night we go to sleep, but God is awake. We close our eyes, but God's creative work is only beginning. We lie down in the assurance of safety and peace, and in the morning the living Christ greets us with grace, with love, with the promise never to leave or forsake us. And each day we are witnesses of these things. So rest assured, literally, rest assured. This world remains God's world, a miraculous place. And you've each sensed something deep within you, something transcendent and loving that is active each day. You know that resurrection is true in your gut and in your spirit. So be a witness of these things. And the peace of Christ be with you as you lie down to sleep and when you awake to God's new day. Amen.